Hello everyone and welcome to another with Electronic ISOS webinar. My name is Markus Ebele and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is Antenna Matching Network Optimization and the Effect of Coaxial Connectors. Our speaker today is Muhammad Ali Khalid, who is working as product manager in the field of EMC inductors and RF components at ISOS. He will hold today's webinar and also answer your questions. As we also take all possible steps against the coronavirus, we are unfortunately not sitting in the same rooms today, but are holding the webinar out of the home office. In case of technical issues or some delay, please take this into account. We will do our best to make a smooth process possible. Before we start the webinar, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the webinar today. This means that you cannot ask us questions via microphone during the webinar. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the webinar control panel. The webinar will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will then be answered in a question answer session following the webinar. There are 10 to 15 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, we will answer them via email after the webinar. If you still have any other questions left after the webinar, just email us at isis-webinar at we-online.com. We will try to answer all questions promptly. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We would be pleased if you take the time to fill out the survey and help us to improve our webinars. You will also receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of the webinar only in the next few weeks. And now I will hand over to our speaker Ali and I wish you an exciting webinar. Hello everyone, my name is Muhammad Ali Khalid and uh, I will be presenting this webinar today. Um, earlier in the day, my colleague Daniel Lord presented the German version of this webinar and this is the English version. We will start with the IoT and different kinds of antennas being used in IoT. Then we move on to the antenna matching and passive elements. In the end, we will talk about coaxial connectors and their impact on impedance matching. This section will, will also include the simulations and TDR analysis. More or less, everyone is familiar with the term IoT that we keep hearing again and again. The IoT or the Internet of Things refers to the billions of devices around the world that are connected to Internet and are able to collect and share data. The applications are numerous and widespread across many different sectors of life. Some of the examples include our homes, um, healthcare, environment monitoring, etc. Here is a fun fact about IoT that the IoT existed even before the internet. Um, this vending machine uh, that you see in the picture, the students from the CMU, the Carnegie Mellon University in Pennsylvania were able to track the stock of the drinks or sodas and they could tell how many bottles were left in the vending machine remotely. This happened in 1982, well before the advent of an internet. And ARPANET was used at that time to enable the communication. Whenever we talk about the IoT, we also have to consider antennas. Antennas are a key component necessary for connection between devices. As the IoT devices grow, smaller in size, the optimal antenna design is proving to be difficult. Depending on the size, cost, and design effort, the engineer has to choose the best antenna. Now, here are the three most common types of antennas that are being used for communications in IoT devices. The wire antenna is low cost and has very simple design, but it's simply too big. Normally, the PCB only has small space available. Then comes the PCB or trace antenna, which shows good performance in terms of gain and efficiency. 
and is relatively smaller in size to wire antennas. But the downside is that it needs RF expertise for design and implementation and not, and not all the companies who are designing smart devices have RF front-end designers. The chip antenna is smaller in size and easy to integrate, which makes it the ideal candidate for small IoT devices. But it always needs a matching circuit if we want to achieve better performance. Here I would also like to mention that the Worth Electronic also offers this antenna matching service. And if you are looking for one, then we will be able to help you. A chip antenna is basically layers of metallization printed on the ceramic substrate. The layers are then put together to form a helical-like pattern in most of the cases. Through this design, we get almost omnidirectional radiation pattern and very good size to performance ratio. Spe uh, specially designed dielectric material is used as substrate in chip antenna with varying dielectric constant. So it could be anywhere between six to 10 in most of the cases. Placing the antenna on the PCB is a little bit tricky since the antenna is the product of its surroundings. Most important thing to remember is that the antenna is placed on ground-free area away from the rest of the circuit components. Here, W is the width of the antenna and L is the length of the antenna. It should be made sure that nothing is placed close to the antenna that can affect its near field because the changes in the near field means change in the antenna impedance, which can lead to performance degradation. Now we will talk about antenna matching, but before we need to review one important concept, which is called characteristic impedance. We all know that impedance is the amount of opposition faced by the RF signal. For optimal performance, source impedance should be equal to the load impedance, which in turn is the characteristic impedance. This can be explained with the help of this water pipe analogy. For the smooth flow of water, the diameter of two pipes should be equal. But if the diameter of second pipe changes due to some reason, all of the water will not be able to go through it. Unless we implement a certain transition pipe design whose diameter can match both pipes. This is the function of a matching circuit. I think we are well familiar with this picture of Smith chart. It looks very complex, but once you get to know it, then it becomes your best friend. It is a very useful tool for RF engineers who are working with complex impedances, as it can be plotted, as the impedance can be plotted on the Smith chart, which is then used for the calculation of the matching circuit. So here is the small detail of how the components move the impedance in the Smith chart. So normally a matching circuit consists of inductors and capacitors. So if an inductor in series or capacitor in series or inductor in parallel or capacitor in parallel. The goal here is to bring the impedance to the center of Smith chart, which is the 50 ohms point. I will not go too deep into the Smith chart itself since there are many free online tools that can help you with plotting this impedance and calculating matching circuit. Here is an example of a Bluetooth Wi-Fi chip antenna working at 2.4 gigahertz. And uh, below the graph, you can see different matching circuits that were used. And as you can see, they result in very different return loss measurements. So with the help of matching circuit, we can control the bandwidth and the resonating frequency of the antenna. Now we will discuss the passive components used for antenna matching. Here, here are the ideal models for inductor and capacitor. The impedance changes linearly with the frequency as expected in the ideal case. In the real scenario, we have losses in the circuit represented by RS. Losses can also be quantified by Q value, which is called the quality factor. Higher Q means low loss and vice versa. This loss becomes very prominent at higher frequencies. So as the frequency gets higher, the wavelength gets smaller. To this small wavelength, the coils of the inductor and the air between them looks like a capacitor. Hence, we have a parasitic capacitance problem. At some point, this capacitance effect becomes so great that it is equal to the inductance of the inductor. This point is called the self-resonant frequency. 
A good rule of thumb is to use those inductors whose self resonant frequency is 10 times higher than the operating frequency. Here is the equivalent series and parallel circuits of capacitor considering the losses. The losses can be quantified with the help of uh, quality factor. Again, one interesting thing to note here is how the losses increase and the Q factor decreases as we go higher in capacitance and frequency. So there are three most common types of matching circuits used with chip antennas on the PCB. Higher the number of elements, higher the freedom for matching. So one can argue, argue that we can have better matching if we have higher number of matching elements. But pi or the T circuit with three elements is the most optimal solution. Because this is because there can be higher number of elements, but then it becomes complex and expensive. So it is not very desirable. And the most common size that we use for antenna matching is 0402. Uh, there are bigger and smaller sizes available for RF inductors and capacitors. Of course, there is the smaller size can be 0201 and the bigger size can be 0603. But bigger size means huge parasitic impedance. That's why the matching components tend to have smaller sizes. Then one can argue that why don't we use 0201 size? That's simply because it's too small. So when we are doing the antenna matching, we need to solder and desolder the components by hand most of the time and it takes a lot of iterations so soldering a 0201 size inductor or capacitor is not very easy now we come to the last part of the webinar and talk about coaxial connectors and their impact on the impedance so these are the two most common sma connectors also called the edge uh, edge launch connectors being used at these frequencies so you can see the effects from the different center pin design. So one connector has a round pin and one other connector has the flat pin. Usually the big round pin design is used for lower frequencies and the flat tap typically is used for high frequencies. Why is that? Because the round post, which is bigger, fits better to the wider tracks just because of the size. And contrary to that, the flat tab is mostly used for narrow signal lines, which are often seen in four layer PCBs. Due to its very slim profile and the flat tab brings less parasitic capacitance to thinner transmission lines. It needs to be handled carefully though, because it can be bent easily and it should be soldered with, with care, which means using the minimum amount of solder paste. Now we talk a little bit about discontinuities and TDR before we can jump into the SMA connector simulation and measurement. In this slide, you can see different cases of discontinuities. It can have different causes. For example, there's a geometrical or material change and it can result in reflections and field, con field conversions. What is a TDR measurement? The TDR or time domain reflectometry measurement with network analyzer can be used to identify this, these discontinuities as it shows the impedance variation over time. In this graph, we can see the different impedance variations caused by the discontinuities. And these can be traced back to certain influences like changes from cable to connector or from connector to PCB. In the TDR, we will of course never have 100% straight line at 50 ohm. That is like the ideal case and that never happens. We will have small influences and mismatches of impedance, but we want to stay as close as possible to the 50 ohm line. Now here we will talk about the connector, PCB and the transmission line interface and, and show the typical combinations between SMA inner pin style and PCB layer stack. What effects do we have to take into account when combining connector and the PCB? First of all, we see the discontinuity. Due to the change in material and the change of geometry, we get changes in line impedance and the field conversions. These effects cause huge mismatches and the reflections. To avoid this, the connection area has to be optimized by using planar matching circuits. This is a very important term, planar matching circuits. I repeat and I will get back to it later on in the presentation. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Here you can see the electric fields of the 
grounded coplanar waveguide and the SMA connector. The geometry of the E field, the electric field, is different on the RF line of the PCB and then it is on the SMA connector. In the picture on the left side, we see the shape of the electric field in a coplanar waveguide with vias. Due to the vias, the radiation is minimized and the spread of the field is limited to a certain specific area. In our SMA connector on the right picture, we see different structure of the E field. It is pulsing from the surface of the signal pin to the inner surface of the shielding using the full circle. This is very typical uh, electric field pattern for the coaxial components. Now, when we solder the connector to the PCB, what happens? We can see the shape of the electric field that is spread quite far and has a different shape to what we saw before. As the geometry changes from circular to rectangular, the field starts to pulse between the signal pin and the ground pins. Thus, we can see how the fields are behaving in real time and this data can be used to predict how matched or unmatched the connection is. Here is another example of SMA connector and transmission line behavior with two layer PCB. The normal end lodge connectors are limited to certain PCB thickness due to their geometry. So they are only available for 1.1 millimeter or 1.6 millimeter thick PCB. The above shown SMA connector can be an alternative to a standard end launch type if a thicker PCB is in use. But the frequency behavior of this hook type is different, so we need to adapt its layout to our needs. Now, three different designs are analyzed to see which one has the most stable impedance response. So the case one, this is according to the initial data sheet layout, only two vias for the chassis pins, no further ground connection and just normal arbitrary RF line according to the formulas, nothing special for the connector. We look at the TDR analysis, in the TDR measurement, we can see that we have too much impedance mismatch in the transition area. Afterwards, the system stabilizes on the transmission line. Remember, the goal here is to keep the impedance to 50 ohms. So case two. So in, we begin optimizing the design by adding two more vias to the ground and create a pad that ensures we have a good ground connection. We look at the result and we see a huge mismatch in the connection area before the impedance normalizes. So what is the reason for it? If we go back, because of ad adding the uh, big ground pads for the ground pins, the connection area behaves now like a coplanar waveguide. The ground pads are also narrow. The distance between signal line and ground, and we know that this distance influences the impedance. In this area, we create a lot more losses than before due to this big mismatch. And in addition, our free line adaptation to fit the connector was also not optimized. As we have a behavior like coplanar waveguide in this connection area, we need to respect this. And in our transmission line design, the narrow the line in this area to get the right impedance. So what we are doing is, is tapering the transmission line in this specific area where it behaves like a coplanar waveguide. Additionally, we use a line taper to widen the transmission line when making the change from connection area to micro strip line. This is the matching circuit for transmission line that reduces reflections and losses. Smooth and curved shape transition is necessary for the success of this design. Now we look at the TDR analysis again, and as you can see, we have managed to improve the impedance response by changing the geometry of the connector and microstrip line interface. 
of course ideal would be if we are close to 50 ohm but this small amount of variation which is like few ohms is okay in this design so that's all regarding today's webinar now i would like to very briefly present our rf portfolio which has been growing quite a lot in past few years here at worth electronic you can see that we have majority of components for the rf front end design and uh, you can get in touch with our sales team if you're interested in any of these products thank you all for listening if there are any questions i would be happy to answer them okay thank you ali for this great presentation as you've mentioned now we would like to turn our attention to your question or your questions and we wait a little until some questions come in you can do that with the webinar control panel on the right with the chat function so now we will have a look at the first question and ali there is the first one how can we access to the antenna matching service so for that you can contact any of the sales team or you can visit our website or you can just google worth electronic antenna matching and you will probably led to this page and which has all the information on it okay thank you so then we have a look at the next question ali if you have a multi-band chip antenna how do we design the matching network to cover all bands of the antenna any tips so this is the tricky part about antenna matching when it comes to multi-band so matching the antenna at one frequency is very easy you know what the impedance is and you go to the smith chart and you uh, calculate the matching circuit you put it back and everything is working fine and happy but when it when we have two different bands to uh, to match to the frequency the then we need to do iterations in this case because if you do matching for one band it can result in the degrade degradation of the other band so in this case you have to play with the matching components you have to do some simulations so you have to see you you might not want to go for very good response in one band but you can go for and bad response in the other band and the op other option is you can have the average response in both bands so yeah okay thank you for the explanation ali then we have a look at the next questions also just the information for you um we you will receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording in the next few weeks so ali next question what are the other smith charts charts tools available online for calculation of antenna matching so you can just google it you can write free smith chart tools and if any of the tool is available it can work it works the same way as all other tools behind uh, the smith chart are there some mathematical equations which work the same way in all of the smith charts so some some websites actually don't even show website they show just the normal matching circuit a toolbar you can enter the impedance and they give you the uh, predicted antenna matching circuit okay so thank you for the explanation then we have a look at the other questions also the hint from me um if we don't answer your question yet we will do that afterwards via email so all of your questions will be answered then we have a longer question i will start with the first one why 50 ohm impedance match is required why not the other value because most of the antenna systems and these iot devices are working at 50 ohms so that's why we always want to match the antenna to the impedance of 50 ohms if there was some other impedance that they were working on the whole circuit the antenna will be matched to the other impedance okay then next question 
why does our F engineers are not using pure resistors, pure pure resistor for matching impedance? This is because of the losses induced by the pure resistor. At high frequency, even if you use a zero ohm resistor, let's say, let's take an example right now, a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth frequency, 2.45 gigahertz. If you are using a zero ohm resistor as a short, it will result in more losses than what if you use an inductor or capacitor in its place. So what I do that I can tell you is that when I, I need a short at 2.4 gigahertz, I use a, uh, a multi-layer capacitor at its self-resonant frequency, which whose self-resonant frequency is closer to 2.45 gigahertz. Yep. Okay. Then we come to the next question. Um, when do I have to use a co-planner waveguide and um, when do I have to use a microstrip waveguide? This is a very, um, let's say, difficult question and there's no one straight answer to this question. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the applications, on the, uh, let's say, customer, on the designer. It also includes the complexity, the cost, because the coplanar waveguides are expensive to design than the microstrip line, but on the other hand, the coplanar waveguides have less radiation which is emitting than the microstrip lines. So it all depends on the designer, which one he likes to use. In my opinion, both can be used interchangeably most of the times, but in the end, it all comes to cost, numbers, efficiency. Okay. Thank you, Ali, for your explanation. Um, yeah, then we go to the next part of the question. As you mentioned, 0402 component size, we are going to use to match impedance. What if my trace width um, is lower than 0402 pad size? Do we need to match the trace with trace width to component pad size? Um, that is not so necessary. It has very small effect, but it's not necessary. Even the different pad size, you can have the matching effect. Okay. So then we will have a look at the next questions. Okay, Ali, how can I find SRF of capacitor from data sheet, simulation, or SVYNA? Um, yeah, the, he means the vector network analyzer, probably, let's say, S parameters for VNA. Um, no, uh, to find the SRF of the capacitor, you just have to look at the data sheet. Most of the vendors provide this information in the detailed data sheets because, yeah. And uh, here, there you can see the, um, the response of the capacitor with respect to frequency. And you will see that at some frequency, the capacitor has one SRF that you can use. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. Then now it is the time for more questions. So we will have a look for them. Okay, Ali, um, next question. Why don't we use bigger sized parts for antenna matching? they would be easier to solder and handle. Yep, um, as I explained, this this is the case. The problem is, yes, you can use it. It's easier to solder and handle, but yes, the, the parasitic impedance for the bigger part is much larger. And we don't want any tolerances or parasitics coming from the matching circuit, which is there to protect the antenna from the same effects. So that's why we prefer 0402 size. Okay. Thank you. Then we have a look at the next questions. If we don't answer your question now, we will do that afterwards via email. Oh. 
Okay, Ali, then next question. I've been trying to do antenna matching for some time now. I calculate the impedance and matching circuit and then I implement it in the circuit. But the results are always unexpected. What, I, what am I doing wrong? So, um, yeah, there can be a lot of reasons for that. Um, I would say the most important thing that which came from my own experience is that uh, the reference plane calibration. It has to be accurate and precise. I'm meaning that the calibration of the network analyzer until to the point of the SMR connector and then from there to the matching circuit, which is also known as port extension. This has to be accurate and precise, otherwise the whole effort would be without any results. So what I can advise is like the coaxial cable should be soldered as close as possible to the matching circuit. And uh, in modern network analyzers like the one we have from Keysight, there's the option which is called auto port extension or APE. So no matter how low the RF frequency, the, we need to do, do this uh, auto port extension because it calculates the accurate phase for the antenna matching. If we have imperfect phase calculation, it will lead to misleading results. Okay. Then we have a look at the next question. Ali, do you recommend multi-layer or wire wound inductors for antenna matching? So the <clears throat> this is a good question. So because the normally the wire wound inductors have high Q factor and the multi-layer inductors have less Q factor quality factor and what we desire is high Q factor so we have less tolerance and good response. But the problem with the wire wound inductors is that they are very uh, sometimes due to their construction they are not easy to solder and desolder by hand. So in my opinion they both of them can be used for this case. If uh, it, it's up to the designer, the, the engineer who's working on the matching circuit, who he feels comfortable with, he can use those. Okay, thank you, Ali. Then we have a look. <laughs> then we have a look at the next questions, and we take some time to have a look at them. Okay, so then I see the next question, Ali. If we plan for 900 millihertz um, RF band, will 0603 parts be suitable for matching networks? Uh, I would advise 0402. So 0402 is kind of a, uh, not written, but kind of an industry standard for antenna matching in this case. So I would advise 0402 size. Okay. And then we come to the next question. Um, I used to have S, Y, y and A in my previous company. Now in my new company, I don't have S, V and A. Is there a scrappy and rough way to do antenna matching? <laughs> This is a good question. So, um, I think uh, no. <laughs> what what we need is a network analyzer. What we need is a impedance information. So wherever you can get impedance information from your circuit, mm. so that would be that would be helpful. That that is the not helpful. Let's say that is required. So I we have been using network analyzers for this. I think we can, but. It's not like all the network analyzers are very expensive. Yes, of course, some big companies have and very high end network analyzers are quite expensive, but if you are just a hobbyist or you have a small home company or something, then you can search for it. There are low cost network analyzers available for very, very cheap price. 
so of course their response so their dynamic efficiency or dynamic range is not the same as the high-end ones but for the purpose of doing the antenna matching at few hundred megahertz or few gigahertz they, they work quite well okay so then we have a look at the next question and we would take the time to answer some more questions yeah ali next question how should i place uh, antenna in case if there is so small ground plane uh, how can i use metal case of device so this is again a little bit tricky and this this can be this comes with a little bit of experience too so if the, there's a very small ground plane so of course these kind of chip monopole antennas they work the with the help of the ground plane so the size of the ground plane is a little bit important factor in this case so if you have a very small ground plane and you think that it your antenna will not radiate too much so in this case maybe the ground plane can be connected to the metal case of the device so in this case the whole metal case may, might be used as a ground plane and for the radiation of the antenna another point is that uh, there can be the metal the shape of the metal case so you have to be careful if you do that because uh, the metal will reflect all of the waves which coming its way so if it's kind of a circular or a tube shaped metal case then nothing is going out so you have to be really careful when performing that kind of thing mm -hmm. okay difficult question but good answer so thank you ali and then we have a look at the next question yeah i see the next one ali while selecting an rf cable for the antenna what are the important things we need to look for so well the rf cable for the antenna so there can be two different meanings to this either it's the cable we connect from the network analyzer to the antenna for measurement or there can be other semi-rigid cable that can be connected to the pcb for the measurement of the impedance uh, for the measurement of impedance but in both cases um, it's not very difficult you just have to see the frequency rating of the cable that's it so it's normally the the rf cables come with a frequency rating Let, let's just say a few megahertz to let's say dc to 6 gigahertz or dc to 18 gigahertz or dc to 12 gigahertz so you can easily choose depending on your frequency okay so thank you then we have a look for the last question just a hint um, we can't um, answer all questions now but we will answer them all afterwards via email so then ali last question as far as calibration should it be done at the network connector level or should it be done at the end of the cable before the matching circuit so both of them you start with the network analyzer cable you do the normal calibration either manually or with the ecal the electronic calibration kit which makes it easier but uh, afterwards uh, when that is done you connect the cable to the end of the cable before the matching circuit and at that point you need to do port extension which this is the crucial step of the antenna matching which people do lot this is the most common type of mistake that people are doing when they are doing the antenna matching some people sometimes they do the antenna matching but they don't ground the cable properly to the side of the board or they don't solder it properly and then when they uh, calculate the matching network and they put it on the pcb they never have the same results what they expected so yes you need to calibrate the cable first from network analyzer to the end of the cable and then from that point to the start of the matching circuit you need to do impid, uh, port extension sorry okay thank you for this explanation and now we are finished with our webinar 
If there are any questions left, we will answer them via email afterwards. So thank you very much from my side for your attention and I hope you enjoyed our webinar. Also, thank many everyone. thanks to you, Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you, everyone, for listening to the webinar. Yeah, I hope you will hear us at the next, at our next webinar. And I wish you all a good day. Goodbye. Bye.